Are we ready? Good evening and welcome to the FDR Presidential Library this evening. It's good to see you all out here tonight. And uh, my name is Bill Harris and I'm the director. And I'm very happy to welcome Peter Schinkel, who's written a fascinating book called Uniting America, um, how FDR and Henry Stimson brought Democrats and Republicans together to win World War II. Uh, we will be in conversation and then we hope you may have some questions. Uh, we've got a fixed microphone over here for those questions in-house, and we'd also like to welcome our virtual audience. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, they will be uh, also brought here for, for me to ask. And we'd also like to thank C-SPAN, who's here tonight, um, to provide a coverage so that this will uh, go out to a broader audience as well. So, Peter, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for bringing uh, this book, which is so relevant to today in terms of bipartisanship, but also uh, brings uh, back to life someone, uh, Henry Simpson, who isn't as familiar to many people, unless they're in our worlds. Um, so how did you get to this topic and who, who is Henry Simpson? Well, first, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I got to this book because in my previous um, book about General Robert Cutler, um, who worked closely with President Eisenhower. Um, I learned that he had a very close relationship with Henry Stimson during the war years because Cutler worked in the War Department. Now, Henry Stimson was an amazing figure of the early 20th century um, when he was sort of revered, a revered elder statesman. He had um, gr grown up in New York City um, he had a very close relationship with Theodore Roosevelt. He was appointed by Roosevelt to be U.S. attorney in New York City, where he helped Roosevelt carry out some of his um, antitrust programs. He's a Republican. He's a Republican. That's right. And like Theodore Roosevelt, who was FDR's <laughs> distant cousin, mm -hmm. although FDR was of a different, a different political persuasion, <laughs> of course. Right. But Simpson would go on to be Secretary of War under President Taft. He ran for election once, a governor of New York, mm -hmm. with Teddy Roosevelt flogging his campaign with no success. He lost, unfortunately, in the election of 1910. Um, <clears throat> and he never ran again for public office, but he was revered as a wise man. And um, that ultimately led him to be appointed uh, Secretary of State by Republican President Herbert Hoover. Um, and he had, during the 20s, he was also um, uh, in colonial administration for the United States in the In, in the, the Philippines. Philippines, that's right. So, he was the governor general uh, over the Philippines. So a broad outlook internationally, uh, both through work and uh, general inclination in terms of how he um, viewed uh, America and, and the world? Absolutely. Although, you know, he, he um, ultimately would um, adopt a philosophy that, that eschewed some of the more imperialist elements mm -hmm. of Teddy Roosevelt's philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and he uh, developed his own vision um, for internationalism mm -hmm. and how the world system should work to benefit all peoples. Yeah, I think it's often, um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but his period as Secretary of State and the United States role uh, 
uh, in so many international treaties or agreements during that, pe that, that period of the late 20s and early 30s is sort of remarkable uh, compared to the, the really pulling back that you see over the course of the next decade. But that's fascinating. That's right. Um, he uh, clearly was at odds with the um, isolationism mm -hmm. uh, of his era in the United States. Um, and uh, he regretted the isolationism mm -hmm. of, of Herbert Hoover, for example. Mm -hmm. So when the Japanese invaded Manchuria in 1931, he wanted Hoover to do more, um, but to, to object to that and perhaps take at military action, he viewed it as a great injustice. He was um, a big believer in, in the future of China. Um, and um, he objected to Japanese imperialism. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he ultimately, however, had to compromise with isolationism and with Hoover's isolationism. And that's how he landed on what was known as the um, Stimson Doctrine, mm -hmm. which said that the United States would never recognize Japan's seizure of Manchuria. So, and that was when he ultimately uh, met... Uh, Mm -hmm. FDR for the first time in January of 1933. That is what he most wanted FDR to take into the White House was a rec an agreement mm -hmm. uh, on that policy. Well, let's set the stage then. It is 1933. So FDR, and this is what I always found, we were talking about this earlier, what I always found fascinating. Stimson is Republican, but um, he's also um, from New York City, New York State, uh, a Yale man. Uh, FDR, Democrat, sure, but also uh, he was a Harvard man. But they're all they're within a social milieu, you might say. So they're different politics, but at the same time, they were certainly aware of one another in the world by 1933. So what what happens? FDR is now president. They both they both are nervous about the rise of fascism around the world. Right, and um, of course right at that moment. So FDR is elected in November of 1932. He won't take office until March at that time. The, the, the inauguration date had not been moved forward. And so um, in January of 1933, um, he invites Stimson to come here uh, to Springwood. Mm -hmm. And uh, they meet in the house and they have an, an amazing conversation that goes on for hours. And FDR ends up driving him back to New York City through the snow. And this is the beginning of a relationship that would unfold for years behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, it would only be seven years later, after the start of the Second World War, that FDR will appoint Stimson as Secretary of War, beginning this amazing bipartisan alliance that would lead the country through the war to victory over fascism. It's an important to note as we think of the, the, the politics of bipartisanship that would play out in the late 30s and early 40s uh, with FDR, that in 1933, setting aside class, that they were of the same uh, sort of uh, social class, um, uh, understanding one another's backgrounds. At the same time, Roosevelt is a has betrayed his class, that the enmity against him by Republicans uh, or uh, more conservative members of society was intense. And people seem to may not be aware that bipartisanship was not um, an easy thing to tackle in 1933 either. Not at all. It was a, there was intense animosity among Republicans towards FDR. After all, he had created social security that hated socialistic program. They, he would, they routinely denounced him as, as a socialist. Um, he'd given labor unions greater power to, to be formed and, and to represent the rights of workers. Um, he'd created large public works programs to help the country recover from unemployment caused by the depression. He was uh, the devil as far as Republicans <laughs> were concerned. So, um, when this bipartisan alliance came about, it was in the, in the midst of this war, <laughs> this very intense um, partisan time. So what's interesting about that is that 
this is a very intense partisan time that we're living in right now, too. Some of these same allegations made by Republicans against FDR are routinely made against Joe Biden um, with, you know, slight differences, but the tones are the same and the intensity of the feelings are, are the same. I know you look at these uh, landslide elections that you see FDR have and look at the, the map and see how many states were carried, but one forgets that many millions of people nevertheless did not vote for FDR and were, were virulently against his policies. It could, considered him anything from a communist to a fascist, which is always <laughs> such a curious uh, uh, stretch. So what's, what's in the 30s? What is Stimson doing? What kind of Republican was, was he? And was it uh, purely because of recognition early on of the threat of fascism that, that they found common ground? Or otherwise, were they completely different? Well, during the early 30s, um, after FDR's electoral victory, Simpson returns to his private law practice, which is a remarkably successful law practice um, in New York City, representing some of the largest corporations in the country. Um, he, uh, among uh, uh, those um, he uh, represents are um, the electric, uh, some electric mm -hmm. industry. Um, and um, he, uh, for example, um, foments a, a lawsuit uh, against the Tennessee Valley Authority, mm -hmm. which was one of FDR's pet New Deal projects to bring electric power to the Appalachians. Um, and uh, this causes a certain break in their, in their relationship. I, I think there's a period, a quiet period, when it's sort of in hibernation. But, uh, but they also share this this philosophy of the need to protect democracy, mm -hmm. that is, it is almost a religious tenet for the two men. And that never goes away. And um, ultimately, um, when uh, uh, FDR coddles American isolationism and he signs the Neutrality Act and he signs two ex in 1935 and two extensions, uh, one in 36 and one in 37, uh, ultimately, it will be Stimson who stands up in the crowd in America and makes the most vigorous argument um, uh, against isolationism, saying America must come to the rescue of the Europeans after Hitler has marched through France and um, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So. That's how the relationship evolves. <laughs> it is. So. Uh, that's uh, the fascinating that they would both see and fear even this existential threat that fascism posed so early and so much before uh, people and to, to guide people towards that. That's a remarkable insight. Uh, and Stimson, uh, you know, to those of us in, in this world, one doesn't often think of as a visionary. And yet he's he's really thinking big picture in those terms. Yeah, he, he, he was, um, although he also can be criticized for coming to it late. I mean, Hitler's rise was through the 20s and mm -hmm. early 30s, um, but the Reichstag fire and the actual mm -hmm. taking of power was, the Reichstag fire is March of 33. So it is after he's out of office, mm -hmm. um, but, um, there could have perhaps been done more under mm -hmm. the Hoover administration to try to ward off Hitler's rise, mm -hmm. but it's the, the the it was a very challenging situation. Well, that gets us to the uh, um, isolationism in in real terms and in the post World War One world and how quickly we pulled ourselves back from that sort of really intense international and engagement militarily, certainly, but in any desire to be engaged. So how, how was the country, but what, what was the country like in terms of its engagement in the world in, in the 1930s? Well, there was intense opposition because many people felt that the First World War was a terrible waste of human life, the, um, including 117,000 Americans who died on the battlefields of Europe. Um, there was a, a real belief that the arms industry had profited um, inappropriately, obscenely during the war, during the First World War, then called the Great War. 
Um, and many, many Americans did, simply did not want to get involved in another European war. Um, and uh, so when the Neutrality Act was proposed, um, FDR signed it. And when it passed, excuse me, and, and he, then he signed two extensions, as I mentioned. Um, interestingly, after the Nazis invaded Poland in September, on September 1st, 1939, um, FDR realized that he needed to send aid to the European allies. And, but the Neutrality Act prevented that. What it said was, if there's an outbreak of war, the United States cannot get involved in that war. That meant that if, say, France or Great Britain were attacked by the Nazis, the United States could not send aid of any kind. Its ships could not go into those contested waters. It was a real firm ban. Um, so he needed a partner to break down that law, to get rid of it. And who was there? It was his old chum, Henry Stimson. And so you've got this is what I, I love for uh, about FDR, the ever canny politician. So he has uh, a need. Uh, he sees a, a tremendous need uh, that the United States must engage on some level. Um, he knows he can't do it with uh, just uh, members of his own party. He knows it's bigger than it's bigger than just a Democrat or Republican issue. Exactly right. But he needs a Republican. He, that's right. <laughs> that, I mean, that's going to help help across the board, isn't it? That's that? right. And because he's he's open to communicating with people from the other side, mm -hmm. he has a Republican partner mm -hmm. at the ready. In fact, it's one he trusts and he, with whom he's built a relationship for years. So that's what's interesting about today's world and, and today's hyperpartisanship. Does Joe Biden have someone across the aisle who he can trust? like FDR could trust Henry Stimson? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We would have to have Joe Biden tell <laughs> us that. But, um, I, you know, or, or, has, or has today's mm -hmm. hyper-partisanship gotten so out of hand that those kind of relationships are no longer possible? That when there's an idea, a deal, or a, a value, or a need that, that transcends politics, that you can find some common ground in order to, to help uh, bridge that gap. Now, we say that though, but it wasn't exactly easy going for Stimson to, to agree because President Roosevelt asked him to be the Secretary of War. So, and he agrees, and it's a presidential election year. Uh, so there's, there are politics going on here. Oh yes. <laughs> Very and Wendell Wilkie, so. of course, electricity himself, and uh, right. <laughs> would have known Stimson too. Right. Um, uh, so it was clearly a political uh, gesture, but I think that FDR realized that again when he so he appointed Stimson and Frank Knox, who had been the vice presidential nominee in 1936, um, to be Secretary of War and Secretary of Navy. Um, on June 19th, 1940. Um, at that point, it was um, it was roughly a week before the Republican nominating convention. And that was a very careful tactical choice that they made. <laughs> that is a very political choice. That's a very, very <laughs> political choice. And um, uh, for example, Knox was thinking of going to the Republican convention and supporting Wilkie because Wilkie was the dark horse candidate and he was more progressive. He was not an isolationist, although he, he made isolationist kind of sounds, but he was not as isolationist as say, Senator Taft of Ohio. Um, uh, Thomas Dewey was a little more obscure as well. And he was the leading candidate going into that um, uh, nominating convention. Uh, but, um, uh, Dewey, so Dewey was the leader, but um, Wilkie was coming along as the dark horse, and he was playing that um, progressive, closer to FDR mm -hmm. side. Um, but by nominating uh, Stimson and Knox to their posts in the week prior mm -hmm. to the election, excuse me, to the convention, it did, it threw a bomb into the uh, mm -hmm. into that nominating process it, and Wilkie emerges somehow almost by magic he emerges <laughs> the nominee for the Republican Party and that it's it's hard for, for people today I think to appreciate what a an 
what a surprise a Wilkie nomination was, and also what a shocking surprise that suddenly two, two of these very establishment Republicans, representatives of their party in the highest levels, are now in the Roosevelt administration. That's Shocking. Right, right. <laughs> well, there's even more fluidity there lurking behind the scenes because Wilkie had been a Democrat <laughs> until the fall of 1939 when he converted <laughs> to become a Republican. And yet he was also uh, uh, re represented uh, energy or electrical companies in Indiana, probably no doubt was in party with Simpson's uh, anti-TVA <laughs> well, work as right. well. They, uh, they both worked for um, uh, Southern... Mm -hmm. corporation and um they had known each other for years mm -hmm. so adding to the layers of yeah, uh, yeah. of uh politics that were going on here and of course after the nomination of wilkie as the as the war is playing out in europe um one of the very first focuses for stimson and fdr is to get the u.s army built back up. Mm -hmm. They see Hitler coming, they see conflict coming. So they have to um, pass a compulsory draft act. They need to build an army because at this time, or as, as recently as 1939, the US could only field an army of 15,000 people. The, the, the Nazis and the Japanese each could put, had armies of 2 million people. So it was the the disparity was outrageous and dire, and FDR and Stimson knew this, and so Stimson and FDR and Knox immediately began going to Capitol Hill trying to get the legislation passed, and they succeeded. And mind you, at this time, all the isolationists and Charles Lindbergh are saying, "No, no, we can't go into war." So. There's a huge national debate that is happening. Um, <clears throat> and that debate, to speak of that in Charles Lindbergh, the uh, America First movement, um, words that sound familiar today, but that um, certainly carried a, a, a meaning at, at that time. It wasn't just a basic political battle over a piece of legislation. This is to the heart of what people thought America sh should or should not be doing in the world. Absolutely. Um, and um, uh, the isolationist movement, in fact, would not disappear until Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And after Pearl Harbor, it was over. And first, uh, America first disbanded. Um, Americans said, okay, now we're in, in this war, mm -hmm. we're going to have to proceed with it. But mind you, Stimson and Knox and the other Republicans Ultimately, Wilkie would, would join with this bipartisan alliance with FDR. There would be 18 months from the time of Stimson and Knox's appointment until Pearl Harbor. And throughout that time, it was a protracted battle mm -hmm. against isolationism. And the, the two key pieces of legislation, both of which were passed with Republican support, thanks in large measure to Stimson and Knox, were the um, draft, and then Lend-Lease mm -hmm. passed and signed into law in March of 1941, so nine months before Pearl Harbor. Lend-Lease would face a ferocious assault, um, uh, and so uh, one of my favorite, I found a number of political cartoons that, that bring this era to life, and one of the most amazing cartoons is from the, uh, the Washington Star mm -hmm. on um, a, 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 in early 1941. It shows um, Stimson, Knox, and Wilkie in a trench outside the White House. And they're in helmets, and they've got their guns, and uh, there's barbed wire behind them, and there's the White House. And FDR calls out and says, let me know, boys, when I need to get the Democrats involved. <laughs> and so there, Stimson, imagine this, this happening today, yeah. where the chief uh, advocates for passage of Lend-Lease were Republicans, yeah. Stimson, Knox, and Wilkie. A Democratic president's legislation <laughs> being pushed by the exactly. leading Republicans. Exactly. It's it an astonishing time. Yeah. Um, so so uh, that 18 months is one of a, a battle. Um, a kind of good old-fashioned politics, um, really. <laughs> uh, uh, but issues that are very big. Pearl Harbor, 
now we're going to be confronted. No longer is there this battle over isolationism, right? That's that's done. So it becomes the uh, conduct of the war and also how society is organized around that war and then how society evolves because of the, of all of that. Uh, Stimson, a man of the 20th century, but certainly born in the 1860s, I think, uh, is confronted by a host of issues. Let's start with Japanese American incarceration and his um, thinking and his views about uh, that and how it came to be. So uh, the internment that ultimately incarcerated more than 110,000 Japanese Americans evolved actually over a period of years. It began, FDR had been raising concerns about Japanese sabotage um, for years, and, and particularly in 1941, well before the Pearl Harbor attack, um, there were Japanese spy rings in the, operating in the United States that caused um, alarm, um, and um, ultimately spies were kicked out of the United States in, in 1941. Um, uh, but uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, immediately um, uh, uh, martial law was declared in the territory of Hawaii. Um, the United States um, was extremely in a state of extreme desperation and, and fearing another Japanese attack, perhaps on the mainland. Um, they feared a, a bombers and, and a land invasion. Um, as, as remarkable as that might seem, um, given the distance that the Japanese would have to cover in order to carry that out. Um, Stimson uh, uh, in California, um, junior officers began pushing the idea of incarceration. Um, it percolated up to the, to the Pentagon um, and it became a matter of being discussed in the highest echelons of the War Department. Stimson in his diary said he was very concerned that it would, as he said, put a hole in our constitutional system. Um, but ultimately, he agreed with it. Um, he took it to FDR, um, and FDR said, do what you need to do, and he signed an executive order and um, uh, the result end is history. And, and so the, to me, as I think of this national tragedy, which is what it was, it was an utter failure of, of our constitutional protections. Um, and it would be overturned by the Supreme Court um, uh, just two years later. Um, uh, and um, and and the and the injustice, of course, that would only become fully known and and um, compensated decades later. Um, but the, ultimately, it, it, the the story there is that um, bipartisanship is not a cure all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't uh, solve all problems. And in fact, just because two parties agree on something doesn't mean it's mm -hmm. right. In fact, they can agree on the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. And this is why we must have a constitutional system, a system of constitutional protections for the majority, mm -hmm. so that when two parties agree on something and it's wrong, the minority is protected. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that also say? And you've uh, certainly have studied his diaries um, and have a sense of him as an individual in a way that only someone who conducts that level of research really can appreciate those of us who have have been fortunate enough to work with materials over the years. Where does um, an, a, a sense of the value, the individual principle, let's say, um, and one's own internal values, which clearly he, he, he did feel that this was not the right thing to do. And yet when the decision time was, was there, he agreed to, to go against what he thought was right. Was there a sense of conflict in him or was it just a question of organizational or institutional duty versus his own perhaps personal moral or even legal beliefs? 
I, I wish I could give you an, a, I knew you could. A direct but I answer. I would have. It's, it's <laughs> a great question. You, you asked the right question, and I wish I could give you the pinpoint yeah. precise answer. And even though Stimson's diary, which is in excess of 10,000 pages and is one of the most widely quoted mm -hmm. and widely respected documents um, on senior level decision making during the war, because he would go home and, and create six, 10 page entries every night. It's an astonishing record. And if you ever have a couple of years, go read it. I encourage you. Um, <laughs> you can get it on microfilm at your local You can library. get it on microfilm, exactly. <laughs> um, but I don't think you'll find an answer as exactly what tipped him over to yeah. say yes. Was it that nudge from FDR? Was it some fear that there was going to be Japanese sabotage? Was it was it i don't really know yeah. the answer to that i think it was some constellation of all mm -hmm. of those coming together and uh in a moment in time perhaps it's not an excuse or even a good justification but it is fascinating and it's always what i wonder about these points when i see people who otherwise express what we would agree now certainly and many people did then to be the the right side of the argument did not do it right. oh it just it, it always sort of hurts yeah which could bring us to other aspects of the um american experience uh during the war years and stimson's involvement in those and let's talk particularly about black americans and um well i suppose uh first before we get to desegregation or not of the military uh we could talk about um about uh, desegregation of the uh, of war industry, war production, war production, in, in war production industry. Sure. Well, they really go hand in hand mm -hmm. because what happened was that um, when the draft bill was being discussed in 1940, in the summer of 1940, um, uh, the NAACP and other civil rights organizations um, called for, urged, pleaded that the new troops being brought into the U.S. Army include African Americans and also desegregate the armed forces because the armed forces were segregated at that time. Um, Stimson, the new Secretary of War, um, did not embrace that. The uh, draft bill did not call for desegregation of the armed forces and the Army's existing um, provisions were, were going to be the law of the land, and they would remain so for the rest of the war, um, uh, with few minor exceptions. So um, in 1941, um, uh, civil rights activists still wanted desegregation. They did not want to give up. They did not give up. Um, and A. Philip Randolph, the founder of uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, who people, I think, today, too, may not appreciate his expansive role um, in terms of advocating for, organizing for, and advancing uh, civil rights among Black Americans at the time. It was an immense role. He had an immense presence. It was a, an extraordinary role. And he led, in essence, a, a one-man campaign um, it, beginning in January of 1941, calling for a march on Washington by... Um, 100,000 black people to protest the and demand for desegregation. And um, this really amped up the tension. Um, uh, now, Randolph was friends with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the, the president's chief advocate with the black community. Um, and um, Randolph... Uh, arranged to meet with FDR um, and with Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, um, in the White House in, in June of 1941. And there FDR asked, are, are you really gonna bring 100,000 black people onto the streets of Washington? Uh, you know, the concern was that there was gonna be a violent incident and that was being pushed. FDR is being pressed. I mean, pushed. FDR is being pressed. And there is some suggestion that part of this was bluff no one really knows. Um, 
whether Walter White and, and A. Philip Randolph could produce 100,000 black marchers on the streets of Washington. I suspect 10,000 uh, uh, marchers would have been as equally <laughs> <Sufficient>. um, yeah, <laughs> uh, at the time. So um, at that point, what happens is that um, Stimson uh, and uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York, another Republican who is a longtime ally of FDR's, and supports FDR's policies on the war, by the way, and he's now part of this alliance. He's actually a friend of Stimson's. Um, they agree to create um, the Fair Employment Practices Committee, whose mission will be to end segregation in the war industries, not in the military itself, but in the war industries. All those gigantic industries making planes and tanks and ships so this is a huge advance for the first time since uh, ever, since the passage of the post-Civil War um, constitutional amendments um, against segregation, against um, unequal treatment of citizens. Now you have an actual agency whose job it is to end racial discrimination in employment in certain industries. And, and Stimson himself, though, it, it, again, we come back to, uh, as we do with Japanese incarceration, where um, on the one hand, uh, his views would be con considered pr progressive to an extent among his class. His family were abolitionists, he would say. Um, they uh, fought in the Civil War. He, he thought uh, slavery was the stain of American history, um, the original sin to some extent. Um, and I, I have a quote because I find it sort of fascinating, too. It also divorces themselves of, uh, of, of his family of any responsibility, too, as he says, um, uh, the section of the country, the South, which foisted that crime upon us, is the part of the country which now protests most loudly against uh, being subject to any of the risks uh, of um, their uh, ancestors, that the stain was um, on the South and the pain was on the South, and yet when the chips are down now. When there's there are questions about desegregating the um, the, the armed forces, Stimson can't go there. He he won't go there. In fact, he has some deep reasons why it, we shouldn't do that. What, what did you? What what is your takeaway of 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 what? It, the one hand is one sees of the era a relatively progressive viewpoint, but on the other hand, just the same old kind of. Uh, classic racism that would um, hold um, back any action. Right. I think it's it's fair to say that um, his views today would, if read today in a fair reading, would be, um, uh, and these are particularly his views as spelled out in his diary about the capabilities of black troops. Um, I think a fair reading would be that those were racist views. Um, so you have, but I think this is a common human experience, mm -hmm. right? When no one is purely progressive and no one is purely mm -hmm. conservative, people have battles within themselves. And I think Stimson was uh, such a fraught character. Um, he, he believed that desegregating the war industries was the right thing to do, but he couldn't go there mm -hmm. for desegregating the armed forces. I should, it should say that he had some um, uh, realpolitik, real concerns about security. I mean, this was the era of lynchings and um, segregation. And he believed that putting black and white troops in the same barracks with weapons nearby would lead to conflict and that may be a reasonable assessment mm -hmm. or, um, or i mean you could expect <laughs> if if there were lynchings going on mm -hmm. outside of barracks there was actually a famous yeah. lynching on a barrack at um in in the south that you know those things could become more common you mm -hmm. could have um inter-military mm -hmm. battles so maybe there's some justification for that decision um but I think there's also the question of his own rash, racial attitudes yeah. playing playing a role there. And it's uh, uh, William Hasty is a fascinating uh, uh, figure in this too, and ultimately his resignation 
uh, Hasty was uh, an advisor uh, in the War Department. He was a, 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 a African American man. That's right. He was and, the first and, black judge in the United States. Yeah. And he he uh, he has this to say about uh, Stimson. Though Mr. Stimson was entirely well meaning which is always sort of the worst backhanded compliment. Um, and I have no reason, and then this is the, the next one that uh, always is a very powerful one. I have no reason uh, to think that in any way he was a prejudiced person. Always a nice give me that's not really, has, doesn't have much meaning. I always felt that he was basically uncomprehending as to the realities of the problems of race in the army and in American society general. That that's a, a, about as as direct and straightforward of a, an assessment right there. Um, he was a pretty good guy, and yet he just didn't get it at all. Yeah. Um, when it you got down to the fundamentals. Right. And that's that's his fascinating. Um, and he's one of many people. I'm not picking on Stimson. It's it's representative in many ways yeah uh, isn't it and you saw it in your research of of the whole issue yeah of people in right and president roosevelt certainly didn't didn't uh stand on um, any um podiums making a, a cry for it himself right so right um but even beyond this now we get to how are soldiers going to vote in um 1944 what seems like a very basic american right to vote I say, and I would hope we all agree, um, wasn't so much the case in 1944, was it? So That's, what happened? What was going on? You know, there were, um, with 10 million American men um, uh, under arms, that was a lot of votes. And, um, and these men were uh, fighting for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. They were fighting for democracy. So to FDR and to his democratic allies, the natural instinct was to make sure that these soldiers overseas could vote. So they wanted legislation passed that would make it possible for all soldiers to cast a ballot. Seems perfectly reasonable, right? Well, <laughs> not so fast because um, the Southern members of Congress had spent many years crafting um, uh, legislation in their states uh, that prevented black people from voting. And so there was a huge uproar and split in which the Democrats in the South refused to embrace and voted against and killed the bills advanced by um, the Northern Democrats and by FDR while we're fighting a war against fascism exactly the the, the contradiction is makes one's head spin to, to think yeah. it's it's astonishing yeah. and and moreover while we're fighting this war against fascism southern democrats are going onto the floor of the house saying we demand that white supremacy be respected and that we can hold it aloft in our states those, these are our state's rights. White supremacy is the word used over and over and over again. I was amazed when I was reading these transcripts of congressional uh, proceedings, and there it is, white supremacy. And, and it was staggering because we're allegedly fighting a war against fa fascism mm -hmm. and, and for human rights and equal rights. And yet in, in Washington, um, Southern Democrats are raising a flag the conversation is about actually the the exact polar opposite. Uh, the polar, polar opposite. Polar opposite. Of that. Yeah, it, it is. What's the compromise? What what happens there? So ultimately, a law is passed that says that um, there's a federal ballot created, but in which that can be distributed to soldiers, but only if soldiers come from a state whose governor has approved its use. And so ultimately. Um, only about 20 states approved the use of the ballot. Only about Not 20, southern states. Not but nor did New York because Tom Dewey uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't want it approved in New York either. But um, um, uh, yeah. Well, it, it speaks, which maybe it speaks also to the transition in, of uh, what you, you speak of as an, the inversion of um, in American politics or party politics that was occurring as we move towards the um, end of the president's life uh, in that Democrats were gaining power, more power in certain northern states, especially in urban areas. 
And so those votes wouldn't have been probably very friendly to Mr. Dewey. That's right. There's a lot of <clears throat> political vote counting going on in the background. Um, but um, uh, ultimately what happens is that um, this, this furious political dispute in the middle of the war, pitting the Southern Democrats against the Democratic president, causes a split in the party. So many Democrats line up and support this segregationist from uh, Virginia, Harry Byrd. And, um, and uh, he's, of course, not the nominee in 1944, but he, he did get quite a few votes in the convention. Um, and um, this is the beginning of the split in which the Democrats become the party of voting rights and civil rights. And the Republicans will become the party of opposition to that. So prior to this, you know, Wendell Wilkie actually had a very close relationship with Walter White of the NAACP. He had the support of Joe Lewis for the election in 1940. Well, the party of Lincoln. The, the party of Lincoln. The Republicans still were holding on to that mantle of the party of civil rights. Well, this is where this, the reversal, what I call the inversion, happens. And um, obviously the voting rights, uh, the, the soldier voting rights dispute of 1943 and 44 presages the voting rights disputes that will dominate American political life in the following two decades. Um, and so, but ultimately all those Southern Democrats will shift their allegiance through a, an array of dis political decisions over the years to the Republican Party, where we now see the Republican Party dominating the South. Um, so, and then, yeah. <laughs> well, um, as we uh, get ready to head to questions, uh, a question, what, did, what was Stimson's view of FDR as a, as a man or as a leader? And we've not even talked about the, the conduct of the war, which maybe there will be a question. If, if not, then we'll get to a little bit of that. But uh, what was his assessment of FDR as a, as a, a man leader? Um, you know, in, initially, well, first off, they clearly shared, shared a deep bond um, a quasi-religious bond over the need to defend democracy. And that was the foundation. They also trusted each other, and that trust only grew through the war years. Um, uh, but um, in the early years, 41, 42, um, uh, Stimson believed FDR was too... Um, weak and too vulnerable to falling under the sway of Winston Churchill. Stimson uh, opposed Churchill's war strategy and believed he was more interested in defending the British Empire than in defeating Nazi Germany. And, um, but ultimately, um, uh, Stimson and FDR would overcome that and together they would, for example, make sure that there was an American leader on D-Day. Initially, it was supposed to be a British general leading on D-Day. Simpson went to FDR and said, the shadows of, of Passchendaele and Dunkirk still hang over these leaders too much, mm -hmm. and you can't trust them to lead on D-Day. Um, so General Eisenhower, of course, wound up leading on D-Day. Ultimately, FDR would, would call Stimson, um, excuse me, Stimson would call uh, FDR um, our, perhaps our greatest war president. Um, and um, uh, Stimson and FDR, for his, per, uh, for his side of the argument, um, he sometimes felt Stimson would make his case too long, like a lawyer and, and building all of his points and going on at length. Um, but ultimately, he always let Stimson make those points. He would listen. And he, for example, when there was a, a dispute over whether to invade North Africa in the fall of 1942, Stimson, with General Marshall, by the way, the Army Chief of Staff, made their complaints to FDR at length, repeatedly over a period of months. And FDR endured it all until he finally put his foot down. And to his credit, he overrode those men and said, no, we're going to invade with the British in North Africa in the fall of 1942. And that ultimately really earned Stimson's uh, allegiance mm -hmm. and his praise. So, so do we have any questions? Um, uh, if you step to the microphone.
Uh, yeah, hi, uh, M.H. Freiberg here. I want to thank you for writing your book, which is really terrific. And I think everybody should read it. Thank you. And uh, my question for you, as you know, is if you could ask Franklin D. Roosevelt one question, what would you ask and what do you think his answer would be? Now, let me tell you what my question to Franklin Roosevelt would have been. And it would have been, if you could do anything in your life over, what would you do differently? And I think he would have said two things. The first thing he would have said is, I wouldn't have gone to Bear Mountain on July 27th, 1921, which is where he caught polio. And I think the second thing he would have said <laughs> is that in 1937, he would have listened to Frances Perkins because she told him that if he had sweetened the retirement packages for the Supreme Court justices, that he would have gotten some resignations, which is ultimately what happened. He would have avoided the <laughs> entire court packing mess, which caused him huge problems if he had listened to Francis Perkins. And I think he would have agreed with that also. Very interesting. Well, you know, there's so many questions that I think historians would love to ask FDR because he was not Indeed. known <laughs> for taking notes and for writing letters that laid out his views. He's, he's in many ways a mystery to historians trying to figure out what motivated him. Um, I've got to say, there are a number of questions that I would ask, but I, the one I want to ask really is, why did he send Stimson to London in July of 1943 to meet with Churchill? Because he knew of Stimson's animosity toward Churchill. And he knew that this would likely lead to some fireworks and he revered Churchill. He needed Churchill. They needed to have a bond. So why would he send Stimson to London? And th this is the, the meeting that resulted in a clash between Stimson and Churchill um, in which Churchill warned that invading across the English Channel into France would result in the, the channel being full of the corpses of dead allies. And that is the comment that Stimson had in his mind when he went back and told Churchill that the Brits can't lead this invasion. And um, so why exactly, Mr. President, did you send Churchill over? Was it that you knew that Churchill would ask that inflammatory question and do the heavy lifting for you of getting American leadership for D-Day? I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll take one from, um, uh, this is from YouTube, from Foster. Um, how did Marshall, Stimson, and Knox get along? That's a good question. How, how, it, setting aside Marshall almost, but how did Stimson and Knox get along? Um, I, I think they um, all got along amazingly well. Um, they were all men who were willing to put their, their partisan views aside for the good of the country. And that's why I wrote this book. And that's that, why this is... And that's is, actually one of the other questions. What was the impetus for this book? What is this? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, good. We'll get yeah. two uh, birds with one stone then. <laughs> that's from Bell um, on, uh, on uh, YouTube. Thanks. So um, uh, Marshall, General Marshall... Um, uh, was famous uh, for his um, uh, manner of, of dealing even-handedly with military and political affairs. Um, and he famously said, um, uh, I have never voted, or sorry, <laughs> my, my mother was a Democrat, my father was a Republican, and I have never voted. So he, uh, he was very neutral. Um, by the end of their time together, Stimson and um, Knox had a few disagreements. Um, uh, Stimson thought Knox was trying to get favorable or special treatment for the Navy over the Army. Um, and, um, but ultimately, um, Knox died early, suddenly of a heart attack in 1944. And um, it was a real blow to Stimson. And, but they all worked r amazingly well together, um, including the early victories mm -hmm. um, uh, of, of uh, 
lend lease in particular mm -hmm. and establishing the contracting system necessary um, and, and the immense military contracting system that had to be put together to build this army, this immense army required to fight uh, a, a war in two oceans. And if there's nothing more entertaining, it's government contracting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take another question right here. Hi. I'm only up to page 40, so I'm assuming based on your title that I kind of get your thesis of, of the book. So three of our last five presidents have had cabinet members from other parties, right? And to me, it was always, you know, who cares? I can't imagine anybody voting for or against Bill Clinton because William Cohn was his secretary of defense. Or in 2024, if a Republican president makes Manchin his energy secretary, like, I don't see what the, um, the effect would be. So my question to you is two parts. So what was the effect of having these members of the Republican Party in the cabinet on public opinion, number one, for FDR, did it actually help him with his election, his re-election rather? And two, in what ways, tangible ways, did this help him politically? Did it really help him get Lend-Lease passed? Did it help him get anything legislatively that you would think, based on your research, he may not have gotten had he not crossed party lines in this way? Well, that's a, yeah, a great question because it is a strategic political move as much as anything, isn't it? Yes, it's a, it's a great question. And in fact, you do have uh, uh, the numbers right there. I mean, um, uh, Joe Biden is actually one of one of three presidents since the end of the war not to appoint a member of the opposing party to his cabinet. The other two were Republicans, uh, Donald Trump and George Bush. Um, Appointing a member of the opposing party to your cabinet is often criticized as symbolic. But the point of the matter, it my, I would argue that there is lots in politics that is symbolic. And symbolism matters and it, and it can change public perceptions and it can change the course of history. And um, well, the, the fact that uh, someone like Stimson could go to the Hill or or meet wherever members of his own party to lobby them to get votes for legislation is an amazing benefit to have for Roosevelt as a Democrat. That's right. But you've asked a very specific question about public, the public response. There was a poll conducted by Gallup, and this was sort of the beginning of Gallup polls in, in, in the early years. And, um, in the weeks after the appointment of Stimson and Knox. And it found that uh, roughly 75% of the American public supported the appointments of Stimson and Knox. And that included, that break broken down by party, it was 59% of Republicans supported it and 85% of Democrats supported it. So it, it paid off immediately in public perception. And so when Len Lease rolled around, you have also asked about votes in Congress. When Len Lease rolled around and was up on the Hill for consideration, it ultimately was passed by a bipartisan vote of uh, 67 to nine, if memory serves. So it definitely yielded benefits. Um, you know, I, I think that um, picking on William Cohen is maybe not really fair because it was it was a different era. The, the, the partisanship was not so intense, but there were the Clinton place, faced, placed, uh, faced plenty of partisanship. Um, but I, I think that um, um, actually, I'm sort of right now harboring a thesis that Biden, who reveres President Roosevelt and who often speaks about bipartisanship, is actually setting the stage by having appointed no one uh, from the opposing party to his cabinet, so that if a great threat to American democracy should emerge, say, as the 2024 campaign approaches, he can appoint a Republican to his cabinet. At that point, it will have impact. It will have symbolic impact. So let's say, for example, a person 
who tried to overthrow the U.S. government and seize control of the White House, even though he wasn't elected, should become the presidential nominee in 2024. At that point, Republicans joining the cabinet would have a huge symbolic impact, and it would open the door for other Republicans to support the Democratic candidate. Another question? And that will be, I believe, I'll be our last question. Uh, yes, I, I, I haven't read the book yet, but I intend to. But um, what effect did uh, Stimson have on the Jewish question? We know we have Eleanor on one side um, trying to get uh, Jewish. Uh, I mean, I'm talking in the 1930s, early 30s, even after the war. Uh, but uh, did was there uh, an opposing um, uh, side from Stimson uh, opposing the immigration of uh, the Jews, of which were certainly treated horribly uh, before the war and, and during the war and after the war? But it's fascinating. We do talk about the State Department a great deal in that, but we never do really think about the War Department. Did he have a role? Um, you know, uh, Stimson, over the course of his career, had an interesting relationship with the Jewish community. He employed Felix Frankfurter as a young assistant U.S. attorney um, when he worked f uh, as U.S. attorney in New York for Teddy Roosevelt. And that was a lifelong relationship. And uh, so when, uh, when Frankfurter would later become a close associate of FDR, he would actually, he actually played a role in urging FDR to appoint Stimson as Secretary of War. Um, when it comes to actual policy decisions, um, um, I think uh, there, there are, there's not much of a record there. Um, I don't think there's um, anything overtly discriminatory um, that I'm aware of. Um, uh, or um, advancing uh, Jewish interests. I think um, uh, one of the most significant um, uh, allegations um, made uh, during this era was uh, that the United States was urged, the U.S. Army was urged to bomb the rail lines to Auschwitz in 1944. Um, and, and the U.S. Army chose not to. Um, and um, that decision um, uh, did not, there's no, there's no knowledge that Stimson played any role or was aware in any way of that decision. So um, uh, we do know that he um, had a very good relationship with Henry Morgenthau um, uh, until 1944. Um, when um, Morgenthau proposed a plan for post-war Germany that would have stripped Germany of its industry. And Henry Stimson believed that was the wrong move and that Germany should be encouraged to um, rejoin the, the, the community of nations and that its economy should be allowed to flourish. Otherwise, you would be setting the stage for yet another world war. Um, uh, but, um, that the arguments between Stimson and Morgenthau over that plan of Morgenthau's became heated and, um, um, Morgenthau believed that the state department had, com had failed to rescue Jews and, and had, um, and, and he was, you know, distraught over the destruction of European Jewry, uh, as we know, millions perished. And, and it was known at that time. Um, um, that argument between the two men became very intense um, and, and it was tainted by their worldviews. Um, uh, ultimately though, um, um, that the Morgenthau plan was dropped. Stimson convic convinced FDR that it must be dropped. Um, so that's his, pretty much as much as I can give you on Stimson and uh, American 
American Jews and Jews around the world. Oh, we'll do one more. Well, you stole my thunder, so. <laughs> um, why didn't the FDR put his foot down, you know, and, and demand that something be done to bomb the tracks and to stop the war, you know, stop the, you know, uh, the, the Jews. I, I happen to be Jewish. I lost, I lost family there. My wife was sitting in the back, lost family there. Um, and and uh, it's not just the Jews in the concentration camps, but it's also the offspring that never occurred. Um, you kill the offspring, uh, God knows how many, you know, six million people died, but how many, you know, b b b boys and girls would have been born to, to uh, create a, a larger population, you know? So, I, I, you know, and also, he stopped, he stopped the, um, what was the ship? I think it was the St. Louis. The St. Louis. Yeah. Right, he stopped the St. Louis from coming into the United States and, and the United States accepting them. They went back and they all got killed. So, so I think that's another thing, but the question before, what, if, if uh, FDR had to do things over again, I think that would be one of the items that he would think back and say he made a terrible mistake. Now, FDR was human just like we all are, but, but not to go ahead and accept these people, I, I, I don't understand. Now, my parents who lived through World War II um, always, you know, they always had the time to talk to me when I was a, you know, a child about these things. And my mother loved FDR. You know, she absolutely loved FDR. And my father fought as a Jewish American veteran in the war against the Japanese. Uh, and he was, in fact, he was injured at one of the islands of a bomb. So I don't, I still don't understand to this day why he didn't do what he did, what he should have done. Well, thank you. In terms of your research with um, with the secretary, uh, um, it is fascinating as you look at it from um, his role as leading a, a, the War Department in terms of his relationship with the president who's setting strategy. So as we close, how did that relationship between the president as the leader, as the civilian leader, um, and as Simpson as the civilian head of the War Department, how did they interact and how did the civilian view versus the military view uh, impact some of their decisions by the end of the war? Um, uh, just to answer the gentleman's question, oh, sure, I, sure. I would just say that, that um, you know, I, I think why FDR didn't act may have something to do with, um, uh, there was a lot of fear and, and timidity frankly, around uh, appearing to be um, uh, acting for the benefit of Jews. And that's why um, I, I think FDR was afraid of being indicted on that score. And so he didn't take action because he thought it would weaken him politically. It wasn't only Jews he murdered. He, he murdered uh, many other you know, races. You know? Yep. So, and, you know... It's not, it wasn't just you, it was anyone, you would, he killed gays, he killed, he killed uh, uh, Europeans that, that did, didn't have his philosophy. And not only that, but my, my sister, who was the um, education director of, of, of the Holocaust Museum in, in Richmond, Virginia, um, she, she uh, did some research and there was also some of our own POWs in the concentration camps, along with the Jews that died there as POWs. So it wasn't, it wasn't just the Jews that were saved. Blacks were killed, other races were killed as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, well, again, I think as we um, close here, uh, what this book does is show you the complexities of the individual, I think. In the, in the confusion at times and the complexities of decision-making in wartime. And the, what I always say, I said it backstage, that ongoing conflict that anyone in a leadership position has between the moral obligation and the political calculation and where in the shifting sands of decision-making that rests. So I think that what you'll find in this book is a wonderful 
a wonderful review and an overview of issues um, that are well worth the volume two. Um, <laughs> Uh, Uniting America, um, how FDR and Henry Simpson brought Democrats and Republicans together to win World, World War II by Peter Schenkel. Um, thank you for being here. He'll be signing books out front. Um, it was excellent. We thoroughly enjoyed having you here today. And all of you too. Thank you very much. Thank you.